Okay, today I'm joined on a Zoom call uh, from uh, Australia with Racecourse bookmaker and, and internet bookmaker now, Warren Woodcock. Thanks very much for agreeing to talk to us today, Warren. Um, thank, thank you for having me, Simon. Uh, you're welcome. Um, one thing you told me, you've, you've laid a bet to lose $5 million to uh, none other than Tom Waterhouse. So should we go straight into that and tell us how on earth you did that? Um, because I, I screwed up, uh, to be very honest. Um, we have a thing called the Call of the Card. It's one of the big events of the racing calendar. Uh, it's on the Monday before the Melbourne Cup, where we have to bet any customer to win a quarter of a million dollars. And most of us tend to bet to win half a million or maybe a million dollars. And with smarter punchers like Tom, most bet probably to win the minimum quarter million, but um, he wanted to back a horse that I didn't like. And uh, so he said, oh, can I have 50,000 on it? And I said, uh, sure, it was a hundred to one shot. And my brain just didn't work. I thought I was laying it to lose 500,000. And uh, in fact, I was laying it to lose 5 million. And I was described in the newspaper the next day as a befuddled bookmaker because I think the look on my face was pretty, uh, I turned a little bit of a shade of green. What on earth do you do when you realize you've done something like that? Do you, do you hedge it? You sure do, because uh, uh, let's be very blunt, at that point in my life, uh, five million would have put me uh, living under the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll go more about your uh, the way you do things and the call of the car, because that's very interesting, I'd imagine, for people over here. Uh, but first of all, can we go back to, you're actually born in America, uh, not Australia. Can you tell us a bit about your, uh, your early life? Sure. I was born in Florida. Uh, my father was an a Australian tennis pro uh, who met my mother in Europe when he was playing, you know, on the world tennis circuit. And he then uh, was the first of the very good players that actually went to America to teach realizing there was you know, good money in it. So he was the head tennis pro at the Forest Hills with the West, uh, West Side Tennis Club where the US Open was, and also in Florida where I was born and he was the pro at the Boca Raton Hotel and Club in Boca Raton, Florida. And he, he um, taught some quite, quite successful tennis players. He sure did. Um, it's a funny thing when you wake up, you know, you think now how crazy it was. But when I was a little kid, you know, my babysitters were Vetus Gerolitis and Peter Fleming and Roscoe Tanner, uh, all students of my father's um, who he taught as juniors, really, you know, to get them to that, you know, high level of play. Not uh, a lot of guys go on tour and coach guys once they reach tour level my father got them to tour level and uh you know peter fleming very nicely every time i see him says without your dad i never would have played on tour right so unsurprisingly it rubbed off on you as well you were not only good at tennis but also golf um i wasn't bad um i was the second best tennis player in my household <laughs> um i was the best golfer um but uh my father didn't play so that's probably why i was number one if he'd played i probably would have been two at that also Okay, now, when your father became a bookmaker in 1984, why did he, it seems like quite a, quite a sort of leap from being a very successful tennis coach to being a bookmaker. Why, why did that happen? Well, his parents, he came, he was born and raised in Australia. He lived in Randwick and he spent his adult life in America. But as his parents got sick, they got older and, and needed sort of some help he came back to look after them, which was, you know, an incredible thing at his stage of life. And uh, I think he was probably a little bored. He started going to the races socially, became good friends with some of the leading bookmakers. And they eventually said, hey, stop, you know, wanting to lay things with us, take out your own license. And he did. But did you, I don't know how old you'd have been at the time, but were you instantly sort of attracted to the race course game um well i really was uh, my father had driven had harness horses when we lived in america so i'd gone to the racetrack since i was young you know with my father who uh had horses at pompano park in florida and at monticello and the meadowlands 
And, uh, you know, so I was always interested in the racing, but uh, from a gambling point of view, I really had no interest until I uh, came to visit my father in Australia and he suddenly put me to work and that was sort of the beginning of it and I loved it. Now you say he suddenly put you to work, you, you had a bit of a baptism of fire uh, taking over the clerking, didn't you? It was a very funny thing. My father is not the best organized quite often. And uh, what exactly happened was I arrived at Sydney airport and he said, would you like to go to the house or would you like to come to the races at Gosford? And I said, dad, I'm tired. I'd love to go to the house. And he said, well, you can't, I don't have anyone working today and I need you to come help. And I said, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So uh, long story short, we drove to Gosford. We had the big, they had these massive books, you know, like the old penciler books with the six columns. And as we were driving, he was explaining to me what goes in each column. And so I got there and then he handed me the bag and I put the bag over my shoulder and we had the, bat, the book there and I was writing. And about the third race, he said to me, how are we going today? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, check the ledger. And I said, well, I've only gotten about one bet and six in the ledger. And he says, well, how will we know how we're standing? And I said, well, it's very simple. If we have more money when we leave than we started, we won because I'm not stealing it. So that was my first day at Gosford. It's interesting there because um, I don't know, in the UK with a similar thing with the big field book, what you do is write the number next to the bet. The punter would get a a ticket with a number on it now i'm assuming that you had to write the bet or something on the ticket because uh otherwise you'd be absolutely clueless as to as to well my father what. was my father was on the stand writing you know think big 78 dollars and handing the ticket and then he'd right, call right. the bet to me i just wasn't getting them from him to the book so in fact uh when people came back it was okay, that's $112, you know, pay them and, and stick it in the bag and we'll add that one to the ledger later. I mean, it's, I hope there's a statute of limitations on failing to report your tax. So when, when did you take out your own license? When did you decide to become a bookie? About six months later. Um, my father and I decided that, like most fathers and sons, while I love my father dearly and have great respect for him, um, as a matter of fact, I have his painting that I had done of him behind me when he was playing at the German championships, but we decided that we also had our own different views and how we wanted to do things at the races. And I was probably a little bit more risk taker and he was a little bit more risk averse. So we both took out our licenses, had dog licenses and trotting licenses, harness racing licenses. And then because of what we were creating, um, we were creating some incredible stands that were customer service related. We only, we only had the one thoroughbred license because we really couldn't run our thoroughbred business on our own. Okay. so. Um, another interesting thing you told me, the uh, two guys that you took on turned out to be a couple of the biggest punters in Australia. Uh, did you take them on because they were good form students and they could help mark your card? Or was that something that they developed after they started working for you? No, the funny thing is, is one of them actually, when he first came to us, is he came to the races. At, it was at Rose Hill and he came to the races with his mother. He was about 17 at the time. And he said, his mother came up and said, my son would really love to get into the racing business. Would you be interested in hiring him? And my father and I have always bo both believed very strongly that we don't want to hire racetrack people. And that's no disrespect to them, but we want to hire young, exuberant people who aren't jaded by the, you know, having been on a race course for 35 years. So I don't want the Clark that, you know, saw a far left running around uh, i'd like to have the clark that is 19 years old especially girls that are very attractive because let's be honest our racing public is mostly men and a very attractive girl will will draw the crowd in but at the time he came up we hired him because he was a good looking young guy um seemed interested and we thought he might make a good clark and uh he made a fantastic Clark and about a year later he brought his brother to the stand and, and suddenly we had the two of them and 
history has said that uh, they've done a hell of a lot better than we have. Okay, so they're they're punters, they're professional gamblers. Yes. And do yeah, they they're two brothers. The funny thing is, no, they don't. Um, and it's it's quite it's, it is actually humorous in the fact that um, they both have runners on the race course who bet for them, and you know bookies will say hey, you backed it with him and him and you left him out. Why don't you back them with him? And his, their runners will say, because we'd like to keep our jobs. And we've been told under no circumstance to have a bet with me. More because we've stayed very good friends. We're very, very close. And uh, as they put it, if we go to lunch or dinner, they don't want me to be uh, forking over my money to them. And they know they'll beat me. Hey, can, you, can you say who they are or is that a secret? Yeah, no, it's it's not a secret. It, uh, one is Sean Bartholomew, and the other is his brother Kingsley. So the Bart Bartholomew brothers. Okay, so we're we're moving away again. You moved back to America in 1995. What? Why did you gravitate back there? Well, I thought that there was an opportunity in the fact that it looked like they were going to leave. They were legalizing sports betting here in Australia to a much bigger degree for bookies. But I thought there would, would be an opportunity for them to legalize sports betting in America. And I felt that there was an opportunity to go to America, you know, do a little groundwork and sort of prepare uh, for that opportunity to materialize. And uh, I was right. I just happened to be 20 years too early. And um, I went to Wall Street and worked on Wall Street because, you know, hey, you know, as one famous guy once said, you know, why did he rob banks? Because that's the where the money was. If you're a bookmaker, you want to go find customers. Well, guys on Wall Street have a tolerance for risk and, and sort of, you know, are punters by nature.